wonderful Luke chapter 15. You know, we've been talking about the last few weeks how that many times we need to lose our religion in order to gain Christ. And I encourage you that if you haven't been here, go online, you can listen to the messages for free or, or get the CDs or whatever and kind of catch up because we've kind of been building every week. And last weekend, we talked about the principle of always valuing mercy over sacrifice. Or another way you could put it is valuing relationship above ritual. Or another way you could put it is valuing love above law. And how Jesus taught this and, and that, that there's this religious trap and, and religious is trying to, religion's trying to suck us in. And once again, remember, we've defined religion as man's way to get to God. And we have refi- defined Jesus as God's way to get to man. Jesus did not come to start a religion. He came to give us a relationship with our Father. But when we get religious, when we start valuing ritual over relationship, law over love, and we start uh, looking uh, more at sacrifice instead of mercy, all of a sudden, we as individuals and the church itself can become a barrier instead of a bridge. And so I wanna pick up Today in Luke chapter 15, there is a great illustration here where Jesus addresses once again this subject of religion and how it hinders people from getting to God. Luke chapter 15, and I want to talk to you about, okay, how to lose your religion. I want to give you some practicals here and some things that we need to have in place in our lives and in our church where we can, we, can, we, can, we can get rid of religion once and for all and say yes to Jesus in an exciting relationship with God once and for all. So, so here in Luke chapter 15, 15, one, it says, then all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him to hear him. Okay, so tax collectors back then, remember, they were, they were, they were bad people. Okay, they're involved in extortion and all that kind of stuff, so it was kind of a pseudo-mafia and all that kind of stuff, received a lot of kickbacks. I know what you're thinking, we won't go there, but that's how it was, and talks about, you know, they drew near to him to hear him, but now look at verse two, it says, and the Pharisees and scribes who represent religion, they complained. You know, religion always complains. And they go on to say, they say, this man, speaking of Jesus, he receives sinners and, very important, and eats with them. Now let me explain why this was such a big deal to the religious people at that time. Not just that these people, these unchurched people, these sinners as they called them, not just that these people would come and hear Jesus, but that Jesus would eat with them. Because back in biblical culture, Eastern culture, if you ate with someone, it was, just more, it was a lot more than just having a meal. It represented um, acceptance. In fact, in some Eastern cultures, they actually said that a mystical union took place when you would sit down and when you would eat with someone. So it was a very big deal. This is why you see in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, the big deal of, 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 of coming together and breaking bread together. You see that in the book of Acts. Why? Because it, it represents union. It represents acceptance. That's why you can think back in these days why probably the New Testament believers in the early church, they had a much uh, better concept of the power of communion when we were actually break bread and how that represented Christ accepting us and proving that acceptance by his sacrifice on the cross. So what the Pharisees were saying here to Jesus is look, we've got a problem because you are eating with these bad people and basically, What that meant was Jesus was saying, I accept these people for who they are, no matter what they've done before they ever change. By Jesus sitting down and eating with these types of people, he was saying, I love you and I accept you for who you are, no matter what you've done, regardless if you ever accept me back or if you ever change or not. Come on, how many of you know we serve an awesome God? We serve a good God. So look, look what Jesus does here, man. Man, Jesus is awesome, that's all I gotta say. 
So once again, instead of just like, oh, blah, 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 you don't know what you're talking about, man, Jesus comes and he pipes in here and he's just like, bam, bam, bam. And what he basically does here in verse three, the Bible says, so he spoke this parable to them. Now he's about to talk about some stories that some of you are probably familiar with. He's about to talk about the good shepherd who has you know, the 99 sheep that are doing okay, but there's one that goes astray. How many of you remember with the lost sheep? I mean, that's just a real common story. Then he's gonna talk about the lost coin. Once again, here's this lady, she loses this coin and she turns on the light and she sweeps the house and she searches frantically for this one coin of value. And then he's gonna talk about the story of the prodigal son. Well, obviously the father and the heart of the father and, and, and just uh, how compassionate the father is and so happy is the father when the lost son comes home. Now this is very, very interesting because Jesus, it says here that he spoke this parable or some of your translations, a parable to them. So this is not three parables. This is not one parable about the lost sheep, one parable about the lost coin, and then another parable about the lost son. This is one parable with three aspects. In other words, it's all the same story. It's one parable with three aspects. Just like the principle of the Trinity, there is one God in three persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And what Jesus is doing here, Jesus is demonstrating the one God and three persons and how the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all have this heart for the lost and all have a heart to accept people no matter who they are or what they've done. So he talks about the good shepherd. Who does that represent? The Son. Jesus is the good shepherd. He talks about the lost coin and that this woman, what she searches and, and that she turns the lights on and she sweeps everything. Who does that represent? That represents the ministry of the Holy Spirit. How it talks about the spirit of God searches the minds and hearts and he, he, he convicts us and he draws people to Jesus. And then the prodigal son, who's that talking about? The heart of the father and the father who runs out and he hugs the son who's been lost. It's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in one. It's one story demonstrating the heart of God towards lost humanity. Aren't you glad that God, his whole nature is to bring the lost home? And so what I wanna focus on here, just for the next few minutes, I wanna look at kind of the final story, and it all ends up with this incredible relationship with God, but I wanna take a look at the final story, but I don't wanna focus on the lost son, I wanna focus on the older brother, because the older brother represents religion. It represents how religion puts up a barrier and is actually disconnected from the heart of God. So look what it says here in verse I'm gonna pick it up here uh, in, eventually in verse 21. You know, the son went out and he took his father's inheritance and he blew it on, on crazy living. He was out there in the slop. Can anybody relate? Getting all crazy out there, getting all wasted, getting all messed up. He's out there in the slop. Anybody else spent a long time in the slop? Anybody at last night, you were in the, you're still in the slop today, no. But he's out there in the slop, man, and he just comes to his senses. And he's like, man, I know my father loves me. I'm going back. There's nothing out here. I thought these things were going to fulfill me and satisfy me. They don't. I'm going back to the father. So he, he starts walking back, and the Bible says this is awesome. The Bible says that while he was afar off, that the father saw him, and the father ran out there and hugged him and embraced him before the son ever even said, I'm sorry. And I wanna tell you today, and no matter what location you're attending and no matter where you are, listen, if you will just take a couple of steps towards God, man, God will run out there and hug you and embrace you. Listen, your heavenly father, he wants you back in his house. So it's a beautiful story and God's out there, the father's hugging him. And then the son says in verse 21, after the father's embrace, he says, I am sorry, and I wanna come back. And in verse 22, the father said to his servant, man, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals 
on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this, my son was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. Verse 25, now his older son was in the field and as he came and drew near to the house, everybody say house. As he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. 